Cool. We're going to talk about seven simple concepts to get results today. We're going to talk about power of listening, how to develop a signature style, why storytelling is much more powerful than selling, how to truly reach the right people, provide them with value, be fantastic, because it's always better to be fantastic than anything uh, different, and finally, the power of gratitude. Let's start with listening. I'm going to go back for you. Do it. Read it. Rock it. So Hemingway said, when people talk, listen completely. Most people never listen. And it's true. Most people don't really listen. Most people, in fact, are waiting to talk. And there's a really big difference between listening and waiting to talk. And if you can master just one thing from today's session, I would suggest it's worth practicing and improving your listening skills. Your listening skills in social media, which we'll talk about in a moment, but really your listening skills in business and in life. Listening has saved my marriage more than once. And as long as I can effectively listen to what my wife's saying and mirror her and validate her and let her feel super heard, I know I'm going to have a good day. But let's talk about the power of listening in social media. Now, I know you guys are all social media experts, and you, I'm preaching to the converted. But there are still a lot of people out there that don't yet fully appreciate the business value of Twitter and the business value of listening in social media. So let me ask you this. How many people here know at least one executive, one business person, somewhere, who doesn't yet fully appreciate the business value of listening on Twitter? Pretty much the whole room. Because a lot of people still don't get it. This is the story I tell literally in boardrooms around the world to people who don't get it to help them start to get it. It was seven years ago. I had just flown in from New York to Vegas, and I was staying at the trendiest hotel at the time, the Aria. I was waiting to check in at the Aria for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, eventually over 45 minutes. So of course, after 45 minutes of waiting to check in, when all I wanted was a little rest, I did what any social media nerd would do. I took out my phone and I tweeted, waiting over, over 45 minutes online at the Aria, not worth it, hashtag fail. Which for any social media newbies, it's kind of like lingo for you guys suck. Well, the ARIA didn't reply to my tweet. The ARIA wasn't listening. And in fact, seven years later, the ARIA still has not replied to my tweet. But the Rio did reply to my tweet within 60 seconds. Now, when I tell this story to senior executives all over the planet, they get really excited at this point, and they think, wow, what did the Rio tweet back? Come on over. We have a room with, with, with your name on it. We'll take better care of you. Some of you guys are thinking that right now. But if the Rio had tweeted that, I would have thought two things. First, kind of creepy that they're going after me that aggressively. And second, why is it jam-packed and happening at the Aria when it's wide open at the Rio? What the Rio tweeted back instead was the following. Sorry, you're having a bad experience, Dave. Hope the rest of your time in Vegas goes well. Sorry you're having a bad experience, Dave. Hope the rest of your time in Vegas goes well. Well, guess where I stayed the next time I went to Vegas, and the time after that, and the time after that? Of course, the Rio. And the story gets better because I liked the Rio's Facebook page, and I got a message from a friend who wrote, hey, I'm having a family reunion in Vegas in a couple months. I saw you like the Rio's page. Do you recommend them? And I said, well, honestly, it's not the newest hotel. It's not the trendiest hotel, but I'll tell you one thing. I know they listen to their customers. She booked 20 people to stay at the Rio on the basis of that 
recommendation. So one tweet and one like has led to at least tens of thousands of dollars worth of business for this company. Maybe a lot more, considering how many times I've told the story. And there's not a single person in this room that could argue that that was a marketing or sales message, because it wasn't. Literally, all they did was listen and demonstrate empathy. People are talking. All you need to do is listen. And no matter what you do, if you're listening at scale using social media, you can leverage the opportunity. How many of you guys are in marketing? How many of you guys work with small businesses? OK, a lot of the room. Cool. They told me right. So if you go on Twitter literally right now, as I did yesterday in preparing this deck, and if you search the words, grow my business, you will see people right now, today, that are talking about how they need to grow their business. Help me grow my business. I doubt if you actually read these, although it is understandably 20 years in security, not able to grow. You might, person might need a little English help too. But the point is, <coughs> These people are literally asking for help growing their business. So if you're a marketing consultant that helps small businesses grow their business, your prospects are there right now asking for help. Now the challenge is not only to listen, but to respond in a way that isn't the way that those executives thought the Rio would respond, but instead in a way that demonstrates empathy and adds value. And if you can listen and then respond to your prospects in ways that demonstrate empathy and add value, you will win over those prospects just like the Rio won me over as a lifetime customer. Now, one of the cool things about social media is after you listen, eventually, of course, you have an opportunity to speak and to get your brand voice out there. And one of the awesome things about social media is it allows you to have a little bit more fun to craft your brand voice. Every brand, every business ends up representing themselves on social media very similarly to how humans represent themselves on social media. So this is a pretty cool diagram from my friend Stephanie Schwab that talks about various ways that you can build your brand voice. Is, are you friendly or authoritative? Are you there to be personal? or scientific? Is your language complex or simple? Are you there to en engage or entertain? And no matter what it is you do, in figuring out your brand voice, you can get a head start on the kinds of ways that you're going to respond to people and talk to people in social media. Here's one of my favorite examples of that. Any of you guys, uh, any, anyone from New England? a couple, okay, a few, cool. So of my New England crowd, does anyone know Cumberland Farms? Okay, all right, now the heads are lighting up. Awesome convenience store. Of the people that know Cumbies, anyone had the Chill Zone product? Head shaking. So Cumberland Farms Chill Zone is a frozen dessert product, frozen beverage slash dessert product very similar to the much more famous 7-Eleven Slurpee. And the chill zone is really, really popular with teenagers and nobody else. So when Cumberland Farms took to social media on behalf of the chill zone product, they wanted a brand voice that was truly representative of the audience that they were talking to. Truly irreverent, truly rebellious, truly sort of like, not caring. So Cumberland Farms Chill Zone, even though it's a very, very large company, in fact, for many years, Cumberland Farms was owned by Gulf, one of the largest companies in the world. Even though they're a very large company, let's, let's take a look at how they respond in social media. Ben Silver writes on the Cumberland Farms Chill Zone Facebook page, sometimes I just lay under the faucet and chug Chill Zone until I pass out. This very large company responds, ha, 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 what a baller. 
Now, I'm not saying that if you're, an, if you're a, an agency that represents lawyers and accountants and real estate folks, that you should immediately jump in to social media and start tweeting and Facebooking like this. But what I do mean is you have an opportunity with social media to bring a brand voice to life in a really meaningful and often more fun way than outside of social media. Let's talk about signature style. Rachel Zoe said, style is a way to say who you are without having to speak. Anyone here have a startup? Anyone here had to raise money? More. And finally, has anyone here ever had to ask for money? Now it's all of us. So asking for money is really hard. Asking for money to invest is also really hard. Um, I want you to meet a guy by the name of Dave McClure. Dave is a VC, uh, has a group called 500 Startups. Some of the folks that have raised money or that have startups might have heard of him. And Dave is a very, very well-known startup finance guy. So when I was fundraising for Likeable Local, we've raised $4 million to date. When I was fundraising, I wanted to get a hold of Dave, found a mutual friend, and they connected us via email, which is often a great way to meet somebody, right? A mutual friend, warm introduction, et cetera. Only this time I got a response, an automatic response from Dave saying, I kid you not, I don't check email, find a more creative way to get a hold of me. That was his auto reply to all emails. Pretty awesome, although challenging. Well, I saw that he was going to be uh, at a conference in New York, not too dissimilar from this conference, a little bigger, I guess, about 500 people at this conference. And so I booked a ticket to the conference, and I was really pumped to go meet him and pitch him and win him over, no problem except there's about 500 other people that planned the same thing. And at every turn, it was way too crowded to meet him. I found myself in a line 30, 40 deep every opportunity, and the whole day went by. Didn't get a chance to meet Dave. I was really bummed out about wasting a full day and, and some cash on my ticket. And I was standing in line at the cocktail hour, waiting for a drink, and all of a sudden, I hear, I need to meet the man that's wearing those mother effing shoes. <laughs> I look up, and there's Dave. In a room full of 500 people, all of whom had been seeking him out all day long, he actually sought me out because of my orange shoes. Ended up having a conversation. He I know everyone now, the problem is the stage is kind of whack. I guess I could stand here. But I like to float, so I'm going to stand here and then I'm going to float. So in a room full of all those people, he sought me out, introduced me to one of his investment associates. Uh, within two weeks, they had put in $250,000. And to date, they've put in $600,000 into Likeable Local. Now, I'm not saying that because I wore orange shoes, I had $600,000 of money that I raised. But the point is, it helped, get the, it helped get Dave's attention. It absolutely helped it get Dave's attention. And so, of course, I now have 45 pairs of orange shoes, and I do wear orange shoes every single day. I don't want you guys to wear orange shoes, but I want you to think about what signature style you can have to differentiate you from everyone else, <coughs> to make you more memorable than everyone else. Maybe it's a certain color earrings or a pocketbook, or a tie, or a handkerchief, or a phone cover. Nobody takes advantage of phone cases. Those are like the biggest accessories that you have. Every, every day you have your phone case wherever you go. So what notice, maybe it's a hat or a scarf. The list goes on and on. How can you develop your own signature style that gets you noticed and helps you stand out and just gain that little edge over everyone else in the crowd? The thing is, the coolest thing about wearing orange shoes for me is that I'm actually doing a favor to introverts. People walk up to me all the time, all day long, and start a conversation with me because of my orange shoes. Hey, man, love your orange shoes. Hey, man, I love orange. That's my favorite color. 
it actually gives other people something to talk about, which then puts them more at ease and allows me to meet more people, some of whom will be people like Dave LaFord. <clears throat> Tell, don't sell. Robert McKee Brown said, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. I believe it's always been the most powerful way to put ideas into the world, but it's gotten a hell of a lot easier and cheaper and faster thanks to social media and our phones and the internet. It's so much easier to tell a story today than it was 10 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, if you were a marketer, how, how could you tell your story? Shout it out. We're an intimate group. How do you tell your story 10 years ago? PR, ER, TV, print. print. Keep going. A couple more. Radio, everyone's favorite. <laughs> 10 years ago? <laughs> TV, print, radio, billboards, direct mail. That's how you could tell your story. Flyers, yeah. Here's the thing about all those, all those tools. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they're actually really effective. But sometimes they don't work. And all the time, it takes time and often money to make those things happen. So it's risky. Sometimes it's going to work and be awesome. And sometimes it's going to suck. And then you're out all that time and money that you never will get back. With social media, with the internet, with videos, it's much, much cheaper and much, much faster. And if the story works, awesome. And if the story doesn't work, who cares? Tell a different story next week. Tell a different story tomorrow. Tell a different story the next hour. Because it's that easy to tell stories in the social web. Here's my story of how we built our very first business. Now I'm three businesses in. My wife and I both had a marketing background, but we couldn't afford uh, a large wedding, and I wanted a large wedding. I wanted to, you know, to have that sort of dream wedding where I could invite everyone I ever met. And so we had an idea, and we pitched the idea to the local team, and they bought it, and we ended up creating a sponsored wedding promotion. We got married at the end of a baseball game, sold sponsorships to all of our wedding partners, 1-800-Flowers.com sponsored our flowers, Smirnoff sponsored our uh, uh, alcohol, David's Bridal sponsored our bridesmaids gowns, and so on and so forth. Raised $100,000 for an awesome wedding, $20,000 for charity. I got married to the love of my life in front of uh, 5,000 people, including 500 friends and family. And the event was great because I got married to the love of my life. But it turned out to be a very successful marketing event as well. Generated about $20 million worth of earned media. ABC World News Tonight, CBS Early Show, and thousands of blogs. After the event, our wedding vendors said, this was great. What are you guys going to do next? We couldn't get married again, so we started a company instead. When we tell that story, three companies, $50 million in revenue, and really, 10 years later, even though Likeable Local is software for small businesses. It has almost nothing to do, well, frankly, it does have nothing to do with a wedding. But it's a great story, and it demonstrates a little bit of creativity and out-of-the-box thinking. And I know already, because I've tested it, that it resonates. So the challenge you guys have is figure out what is that story for you and your clients that's going to resonate, and how can you tell it? There are so many ways to tell your story. A blog post, a webinar, a tweet, an infographic, a Facebook post, the list goes on and on. The only thing better than telling your story in the social web is inspiring others to tell your story for you. Getting your customers, your employees, your clients, your friends to tell your story or your client's story for you. Here's my favorite example of that of all time. It's from a very large company that you all have heard of that spends a lot, a lot of money on advertising. But this is a little bit of free advertising thanks to social media and thanks to storytelling. Allow me to introduce you to the I Love Mary at McDonald's in Chandler, Arizona Facebook page. True story. Now, let's look at a couple things about this page. First of all, there are 1,400 plus members of the I Love Mary at McDonald's and Chandler, Arizona Facebook page. 
over 1,400 people have put their hands up saying, yep, I like Mary, or rather, I love Mary. But even better than that are some of the comments on the wall of this page. I love, I haven't seen Mary lately, where has she been? Happy People Day, Mary. We love you in the Rocky Mountain region, and my personal favorite. This is, you have, you can't believe, you have to see this to believe it. Mary is the best. This is the picture of us at my 40th birthday party on Saturday night. By the way, just to illustrate how true this whole thing is, I was doing a South by Southwest keynote, and after I came off the stage, somebody walked up to me and said, Dave, I have to tell you, I've been to that McDonald's, and Mary really is the best. Dude, if you've been, you got you to get to see it. you got to see her. So, so my question's for you. My question for you is twofold. First, who's your Mary? Well, who was your customer or employee? Rather, sorry, who's your, who's your employee or product or service that is worthy of being talked about? That is truly worthy of telling that story? For me, at Likeable Local, it's a product called it's a feature called Turbo Post. It takes every single post on Facebook and automatically turns it into a promoted post, an ad. There's no other company on the planet that has Turbo Post. That's my Mary. What's your Mary, or who's your Mary? And then second, equally important, maybe more important, who's your Delin Lucas Bach? Delin Lucas Bach is the customer who went out of her way to build the I Love Mary and McDonald's and Channel Arizona Facebook page and start inviting friends to it. So everyone here has a customer, or hopefully you have a customer, or your clients have some customers who would be willing to go that extra mile. For likeable local, probably Dr. Red Cross, for instance. He's an example of a customer who's gone out of his way to tell the world how much he loves us. Who's your Mary and who's your Delaine Lucas Bach? Here are just five stories to tell that really I have found resonate very well in the social web. Your humble beginnings, no matter how big you are, it all started with X. Clients who have overcome obstacles thanks to you. Employee challenges and how your employees, or your clients' employees have grown thanks to you. Inside the lives of leadership, you all have that stodgy CEO or CFO you know, and, and sort of getting to, the, getting to the inner core of who that person is, is often fascinating. Community and charity partnerships. Maybe you partner with a local Little League team or uh, Girl Scouts or another organization. Oh, that's five. So how can you tell your story? Blogs, webinars, eBooks, like I said, lots of different examples. Let's talk about reaching the right people. Bill Gates said, my success, part of it certainly, is that I focused in on a few important things. How many of you have seen the movie The Social Network? There's a line in the movie The Social Network. You know what's cooler than a million dollars? A billion dollars. My line is actually the opposite, though. You know what's cooler than reaching a billion people on Facebook? Reaching the right thousand or the right hundred or the right 10 to grow your business. I mean, unless you're Coca-Cola or Pepsi, you don't need to reach a billion people. But reaching the right people will help a lot. So you use hyper-targeting and nano-targeting. Facebook's got data on 1.8 billion people, and you can reach any or all of them based on the targeting criteria that you put in. Stuff like email list, custom audience, interest, job title, employer, age, zip code, the list goes on and on. So if you're a Chinese food restaurant in Cleveland, you can just target people in Cleveland that like Chinese food. Why would you waste any money or time targeting anyone else? Here's an example that usually brings home the point. I was in Texas at a conference actually, and I took out an ad targeting 34-year-old married Females that went to Emerson College, worked for Likeable Media, were married, and lived in the zip code 11050 of the billion people on Facebook at the time. Only one person saw that ad. My wife. Aww. And actually, the really funny PS to this story is that 
she's such a social media nerd too that she actually responded by taking out an ad targeted me. We went back and forth on Facebook for like a month targeting each other with Facebook ads. And the cool thing is, if, if, as long as you don't click on the ads, they're free, of course, because they're pay per click. So we spent no money on that whole ad process. So the point is, if you want to send home, you know, your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, an ad, that's cool. But more important, if you want to reach a very, very precise target audience, you can using social media advertising. And that's extremely powerful. So once you reach people, it's important not to spam them. It's important to actually step up and be valuable for them. And that goes whether you're reaching thousands or millions of people through social media or, or one person in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Albert Einstein said, try not to be a man of success, but rather a man of value. Take a look at this slide. You know, it, it's funny, when people first meet, it can be extremely awkward. Again, whether it's through social media or face to face. Meet Michael Kislin. Scissors, pun, not intended. Michael Kislin is one of many, many people to target me to try to sell me shit. One of the downsides of being a I don't know, relatively successful entrepreneur, is that I get targeted with emails every single day. Is there any, anyone in the um, real estate business? Cool, anyone in the um, financial planner, wealth management business? Awesome, so I can make fun of both of those businesses. They hit me up every single day, I'm not even kidding you. Every day, we have a great space to show you, we have a, uh, I, I want to talk to you about your portfolio, how to make you more money, every single day. And Kislin was one of those dudes. He's a financial planner, and he emailed me. But his email was a little different. It stood out to me. His email said, Dave, I'd like 15 minutes with you. I promise I won't try to sell you. And I have just one question I really want to ask you. It kind of piqued my interest. And I decided, OK, sure, I'm going to give you the 15 minutes. I responded, you got it, come on in, give you the 15 minutes. He comes in, he says to me, just, just, give, just for, the, for a minute, just tell me a little bit about what you do and what you're up to. So I said, fine, I'm an entrepreneur, author, uh, my newest company is called Likeable Local, we're doing some fundraising right now, looking to meet VCs. He says, great, that's really helpful for me. I said, all right, well, tell me about what you do. He said, no, I'm not gonna really tell you about what I do, you know the basics already. But here's my one question for you. How can I help you? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how can you help me grow my portfolio? Like, you know, how can you help me make more money? He's like, no, no, no. How can I help you? For instance, often I help people by introducing them to one another. Maybe I can introduce you to a VC. I was like, all right, yeah, okay, sure. You can help me by introducing me to a venture capitalist. I'll, I'll take it, thanks a lot. So tell me about like, what you do, give me the quick sales pitch. I said, absolutely not. I promised you no sales pitch. I am here to find out how I can help you, and that's it. He introduced me to a VC. Nine months later, I had some money kicking around, called him up. He became my financial planner, introduced him to my mother-in-law. She had some money. He became her financial planner. The guy has gotten like four new clients now. He didn't get it by selling me. He got it by being a person of value, by asking me the five most powerful words in any first meeting, how can I help you, and truly meaning it, asking it authentically, and truly being there to help. Ask me how I'm doing today. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic! So I learned that trick, like, nah, uh, First year of teaching, so solid 15, 16 years ago from somebody at a conference. And it's really, really powerful. Most people, if you ask how they're doing, they say, fine, fine, okay. Actually, the new version of that, the like 2000s version of that is busy. Fine, I'm okay, I'm really busy. Tired. You guys want to hang out with somebody who's like busy and tired? I don't. 
Do I just want to hang out with somebody that's fantastic? Hell yeah. So when people ask me how I'm doing, no matter what, I say I'm fantastic. We'll talk about how to get there in a minute. But like, it opens up doors because people do want to hang out with me. It turns out your attitude is literally contagious. So if you're fantastic, you're going to help other people be fantastic. And if you're shitty, fun, busy, down, you're going to make other people that way. We all have something called mirror neurons that actually mirror the attitude of the people that are speaking to us. It's, it's crazy, but it's totally true. So if you walk out of here like, like feeling really tired and down, like it's totally my fault. But hopefully you walk out of here feeling pumped and excited because I am so pumped and excited right now. And you all have the mirror neurons that do actually mirror the neurons in the person that is speaking to you. So if you're a leader in any way, if you're a salesperson, if you're a marketer, if you ever have to influence somebody else, the number one factor in influencing them is your own mood and your ability to literally be fantastic. Now, the reality is we're often not normally fantastic. Like, I get it. You can't always be fantastic. So here are two ways when you're not fantastic to get fantastic, like in 10 minutes or less, really five minutes or less, I would say. Because by the way, a lot of the times you have a meeting or a date or a, something that you have to actually be on for and you're not really feeling, right? How many of you have that experience where like, you know you have to be on but you're not really feeling up to it? Yeah. So here it is, two secrets, both super simple. Here's number one, act kindly. Yeah, really simple but totally true. A few years ago, I was having a really shitty day. I lost like a $100,000 client. That was like the first thing in the morning. And then I had to uh, lay off the person that made me lose that $100,000 client. That's always really shitty. And then I had to take a train into Washington, D.C. for a big pitch meeting. And the train was delayed. I was upset about that. So I finally get into D.C. And this was before I learned this little trick. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to use another trick to get into a good mood. Food. Why not, right? So I looked up the best sushi restaurant in Washington, D.C. I was like, I'm going to go to the sushi restaurant. I'll walk, even though it's a little hot, because it's good to get exercise. So I'm walking about a mile to this sushi restaurant. I'm starting to sweat, starting to really not be in a good place, because I know I have this big meeting and I'm sweating. And um, I finally get to, I'm thinking, you know what, it's OK, because I'm going to get, I'm going to have my sushi, and it's going to be good. Finally get to the sushi restaurant. What do I see, of course, on the front? Closed. Now I'm like, I'm so freaking pissed. I'm in such a bad mood. I have had the shittiest day ever. And now I don't even get my sushi, and I don't even really have time to like get a decent lunch anywhere. Well, I'm like walking as quickly as I can to get to the main meeting I'm going to. And I see a homeless person asking me for change. So normally I actually don't give any money to homeless people because I prefer to give to organizations. But I'm feeling kind of generous, so reach into my pocket. And he gets excited because he sees me reach into my pocket. He's kind of walking up to me, all excited. I don't have any change in my pocket. Now I have that really awkward moment. We've been there. I'm like, oh no, what am I going to do? I'm like, you know what? F it. I'm going to give him a dollar bill. I'm really going to make his day the wall. Now he's getting more excited. No dollar bills. All I've got is a 50. So I'm like, I got a choice right now. I can be like the whole, I'm so sorry, dude. I'll get you next time, which obviously would be a complete lie. Or I can hand over the $50 bill. This time I chose to hand over the $50 bill. You would have thought that this man literally hit the lottery and won a million dollars. Freaking out, jumping up and down, so happy, so grateful, so joyful, so ecstatic. Begged me to hug him, which I did. 
We had this amazing moment together, and my mood completely transformed from shitty to like amazing on cloud nine. For, by the way, a crazy low investment in the long run of $50. Went to the pitch, won the pitch, the rest is history. So act kindly. I didn't have the picture of the guy, unfortunately, so that's a, just a separate example. But whether it's going downstairs to give to a homeless person or holding a door for the next 10 people to come into your office building, or if you're really in the mood to act kindly, you can do what I do, the ultimate act of service. Once in a while, I call my mom. <laughs> but just the very act of focusing on somebody else and acting kindly for somebody else will absolutely transform your mood. And the other hack, on a very similar note, is gratitude. And so I'm going to close by just sharing a little bit of what I've learned about gratitude. G.K. Chesterton said that I would maintain that thanks to the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I am a very, very big fan of gratitude. In fact, I did a lot of research for my second book, Likeable Business, which we will give away as one of our prizes in just a moment. I interviewed about 300 CEOs, some of the most successful people in the world. And what I found was that the number one thing that they had in common was active gratitude practices. So Carrie Chesick, founder of Restaurant.com, woke up and every morning the first thing he did was he wrote five people that he was grateful for. Andy Cohen, good real estate entrepreneur friend of mine, made a daily habit of emailing five things that he was grateful for every single day. Sheldon Yellen wrote thank you cards for his employees' birthdays every single day, which is kind of cool, but it's even more impressive when I tell you that Sheldon Yellen is the CEO of a company called Belfort that has 6,000 employees. So he writes an average of 17 to 21 thank you cards every single day. The amazing thing about gratitude is it transforms your mood. So I, I became a big fan of writing thank you cards. I started out by writing one per day. Then now I write three per day. And uh, actually, DonorsChoose.org, any of you guys know DonorsChoose? Really awesome nonprofit based here in New York. Opportunity to uh, go onto DonorsChoose and give to any teachers. They actually did a study where they compared the effects of handwritten thank you cards, or what I call the original social media. And they found that those people that got handwritten thank you cards were 38% more likely to donate than people that got email thank yous. And on average, they donated more. Because here's the thing, in this day and age of social media, texting, email, super easy to send that kind of thank you. It's harder to go out of your way and send a handwritten thank you card. So the, the, the power of the thank you cards for me is twofold. First, when clients and customers, employees, partners, media, prospects, vendors, get my thank you cards. They're like, whoa, social media guy sent a handwritten thank you card? That's cool. But even more important, if I never sent those thank you cards, as I'm writing them and experiencing that gratitude, it's changing my mindset from a bad mood to a good mood, good mood to great mood, great mood to totally ecstatic. I truly honestly believe that gratitude Thank you card specifically is the greatest drug on the planet because the effects are powerful and there are absolutely no side effects whatsoever. Okay, quick recap and then we're going to give away a grand prize. Actually, I'm going to do two prizes. One uh, for somebody who put their business card in there. Did you get everyone's business? Raise your hand if you didn't get your business card in there with Shannon. Awesome, she'll come around last chance. And then one uh, to somebody that has been tweeting with the hashtag DigiMarkConEast. We talked about listening first and never stop listening. I'm all about action steps, so I'm going to give you one very specific action step to walk away with for each of these points. And if you get like, thank you, everyone, I thought I saw one more hand. No? And if you get like one or two things, that's really all you need to get from a conference. I know I've been to so many conferences, and I know at the end of the day you walk away totally overwhelmed, and you end up getting nothing done because you got too much input. 
So my, my pitch to you is try to get one thing from this keynote, maybe two, max. So listen first and never stop listening. You can actually measure your listening versus talking ratio in order to improve it. I got this from Vern Harnish, founder of Entrepreneurs Organization. You can use an assistant or an intern or stopwatch to literally time how much time you spend in a meeting listening versus talking and then walk away with actual listening KPIs to work on. Develop a signature style, figure out what your orange shoes are What's going to work for you? Tell, don't sell. Who or what is your Mary from McDonald's? And who is your Delin Lucas Bach that's going to tell, help tell your story? Reach the right people. Who specifically do you want to reach? And how can you reach them using social media targeting? Be valuable. How can you make those magic five words? How can I help you? work for you in a meaningful and authentic way. Be fantastic. As an experiment, try it. Next time somebody asks you how you're doing, just turn around and say, I'm fantastic. Watch what happens. People will freak out. You will become addicted to saying you are fantastic. And finally, be grateful. How can you pick up what I argue is the world's greatest addiction? I'm going to close with a quote from my mentor and friend, somebody that helped to change my life with my first book, Seth Godin, who writes, how dare you settle for less when the world has made it so easy to be remarkable. None of these concepts are rocket science. In fact, they're all super simple, and yet so few people do them. So few people use them, especially so few people use them in social media. And if you can adopt just one or two of these, you can absolutely be remarkable, stand out, and win. Thank you very much.